And thank you very much for coming to join us today, Eric. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about how it all came about. Uh, my company helps people start their construction projects. And I was talking to one of the fire victims a couple of months ago, and she was saying, you know, people just keep building the same way they've built before. And it kind of stopped me in my tracks because this is not how we should be doing it. There is a better way. And uh, I think what you're working on is actually part of the big picture. And that's why it's a pleasure to welcome you. Uh, please tell a few words about yourself uh, so that uh, our guests can uh, kind of learn more about you because I have a, a bit of an advantage here. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. Glad you're all here. Uh, my, my understanding is a lot of you are from uh, Northern California, Santa Rosa area. So what I have to say today is especially uh, re relevant because of all the things you've gone through the last few years. <clears throat> I'm the director of the California Chaparral Institute. It's a nonprofit research and educational outfit. And the uh, mission is to try to help people to reconnect with nature so they can have a more enjoyable. And that also includes understanding it, I mean, safely in it, which in California, that, that relates a lot to fire too. So we uh, do a lot of publications. We do um, this really uh, exciting chaparral naturalist outreach program that we do for communities to help people understand the native habitats around their California homes. And what we're doing right now is actually one of my favorite things to do is just sort of share our knowledge about how to live in the environment safely firewise. Uh, and there's a lot of things you're probably gonna hear here that are contrary to what you've heard already many times over and over. And so um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. And uh, I guess what we'll do, uh, we'll do the questions after or during, or how's that going to work? Or in the chat box? Well, I, I think yeah, let's let's hear what you have to say. And then uh, we are not a big crowd today, so we can just okay. <laughs> uh, unmute and talk. All right. Well, great. Well, I'll just go ahead and start with a little PowerPoint and give you some perspectives here. And yeah. Um, yeah. I used uh, to we'll, biology. We'll, what's that? Yeah. Will you cover how you got, how Chaparral got connected to fires in, in, in the first place? Will you cover that in the presentation? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay, go for it then. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, God, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, you started to say that you, no, you, I mean, you, you were I, in biology. <laughs> you were in biology. Yes, I, yes, I, um, <laughs> what I was trying to say is, uh, Feel free to inter interrupt me because I used to teach high school biology. And so you asked me the question and it throws me for. <laughs> but anyway, um, I left high school biology about uh, 20 years ago and to dedicate myself toward what I'm doing now. And uh, I didn't know much about fire until the 2003 Cedar Fire, which burned right through our community. And, and there were so many misconceptions on the radio and, and in the newspapers and pretty much everywhere you looked, but I just felt it was important to try to get the information out, being the teacher that I was. So I want to start out with is a little PowerPoint and I'll share that right now with you. And let's see here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, just to give you a little uh, personal insight into this story, this is one of the fires in San Diego County that we had and um, I was out near this community and this gentleman was up on a roof, which you've seen probably many times. Uh, one of the most famous is President Nixon doing this in his Bel Air home uh, in 1963 in the Bel Air fire. But, um, you know, this is a pretty terrifying event. And uh, the house did not burn because about, I'd say, three seconds after I took this photo, there was a big fire retardant uh, plane that dropped a huge load of chemical on the on the fire and extinguished it. But as you can see, the man sitting there or standing there rather with this little tiny garden nose with this wall of flame and these shake shingle roofs creating an environment that's incredibly dangerous um, for him and the homes and everything else. So uh, what I want to focus on here is we, we really are living in a changing environment. And we're going to talk about three particular things. Um, a little history about where we are and why how we got here and, and and how that environment's been shaped, and a little bit about wire, wildfire. And this is the part you probably uh, uh, find a lot of cognitive dissonance in, in terms of what you used to believe and what I'm telling you. And hopefully, we can come to an understanding on on the science here, and also uh, the role humans play. 
So essentially we'd created a, a fire prone environment into a, a sort of a catastrophic environment that uh, allows fires to burn everywhere all the time. And we have to learn how to adapt to us as well as the environment itself. So the best way to do that is from the house out. And that's kind of sort of a, a, a keystone phrase that uh, we're gonna talk about more later. But these are the three main concepts that uh, I wanna address. So let's take a look at um, the history, first of all. So I know you've heard about droughts in California and no droughts and a lot of rain, no rain. So what you're looking at here is a graph. And this is based on tree ring data that is measuring the width rings in the Southwest, the pine forest of the Southwest. And what they've done here is use tree ring width as a proxy for drought or no drought. And they assigned it and they mushed the numbers the, uh, the actual data is the dark lines and the sort of average data is the red lines. And what is the data? Well, the lines that are going uh, toward the top, that's when you have drought conditions. And that was measured by very, very thin tree ring lines. And uh, when you have a lot of rain, that's when you get the lower level. And the dotted line at the bottom is really sort of the maximal average extreme drought level. And it was only ever breached several times over the last thousand years, which is what this graph is showing you. And the worst drought we had in the last thousand years up until recently is at that black arrow there. Um, in comparison to where we are, uh, at least where we were a couple of years ago is that green circle in the lower right-hand corner. So the droughts we've experienced this last uh, decade are worse than they've been in a thousand years. And that creates a very flammable environment because you've got a lot of dry material out there. And now we put homes in these environments and we didn't usually have to confront this issue before, but now we do. So this data has also been uh, correlated with uh, oak trees in California and they've come up with the same data set. So I wanted to bring that in to say that, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty Western wide uh, phenomena, this, this drought period that we're in. So we're gonna talk about this in, uh, a little later about the future and what the predictions are, but. This sort of gives you a perspective of the natural environment that we're in. And it was predicted uh, about 10 years ago that we'd have an uptick about five years ago in terms of uh, rainfall. And indeed we have, the last couple of years have been pretty nice. Um, there's still a lot of dead vegetation out there, but the vegetation has been a lot wetter than it's been before. And uh, how, how long is this wet period gonna, going to uh, proceed? Well, those, <laughs> those are predictions, of course, and we'll get into that at the end of the presentation. So I'll I'll hold off on that for, for a moment. So I just want to talk about fire in general uh, in reference to where you may live and where you build your homes. So there's basically fire regimes, we call them, that uh, are determined by the kind of ecosystem you live in. So if you live in a forested area, it has a different kind of fire pattern than if you live in a chaparral area, which you see in the lower left-hand corner. And you basically have what you call surface fires and crown fires. Surface fires you have typically in Western dry ponderosa pine forests where you have a lot of fires within a period of maybe 10, 15 years, a couple maybe. Um, and they often burn the understory and they don't do much to the trees other than an occasional, what we call uh, cat face scar at the bottom, but the trees continue on. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that you can't have a high severity fire in these forests, it's just that they aren't as frequent as they would be in other environments. And then you have crown fire regimes. And in crown fire regimes, when the fire comes through, everything gets torched. And you get headlines like, you know, it's a moonscape. It's, it's, it was so hot, it sterilized the soil. It's somehow unnatural. And well, that's actually not true at all. There's a lot of systems, chaparral in particular, that have crown fire regimes. And when you have fire in those systems, there's nothing they can do other than what you just see here, leaving behind a barren landscape that appears barren, but in fact, it's, it's primed for an explosive growth of lots of wonderful things after the rainfall. And you, you have this kind of a uh, fire pattern also in some forests. This is Yellowstone that burned in um, 1988 and people were uh, blamed and fire services were uh, excoriated. But the fact of the matter is that fire was perfectly natural uh, but it was in a forest and it was a crown fire and it burned tens of thousands of acres right down to the ground. And if you've been back to Yellowstone since then, 
it's just an explosive display of just wonderful biodiversity in life. So nature has a remarkable way of uh, incorporating fire into its system, but it has different ways to, of doing so. And I wanna focus particularly on chaparral because that's the system I study. And that's the system that's responsible for a lot of the fires we have and we happen to build in it, unfortunately. This is behind my house prior to the 2007 Witch Creek fire. Um, chaparral is naturally dense. It's often impenetrable. Sometimes you'll find little tunnels like this. These used to be in, in the chaparral all the time. Uh, when the grizzly bears used to roam, they used to make these tunnels and they put their paw in the same place generation after generation. And so I can imagine when you're running through one of these tunnels as a Native American, uh, for example, and you meet a grizzly bear on the other side, it's uh, not too hopeful of, of an event because they're pretty aggressive animals. But anyway, um, what happens when the chaparral burns? Well, there you go. Same place. Uh, my son there re-sprouted, so uh, as many chaparral species do plant-wise. <laughs> but uh, let me go back and I'll show you this again. Same scene, same situation. Now, a lot of people will look at this and, and feel sad. They'll say this, the system was destroyed. The uh, so soil was sterilized. None of that's true. It's horrible and catastrophic when people die and homes are burned. But if the fire comes in a natural pattern, and it did here in this situation, um, the system will recover and come back marvelously. And when I talk about a natural pattern in chaparral, it's uh, as long as you don't have too many fires, so no more than one per 30 years, because the natural fire return interval for chaparral is 30 to 150 years or more. The problem is we're having too many fires in chaparral, and that's leading to what we call type conversion, which is where you get grasses, non-native grasses, and a lot more flammable material. And you see a lot of that in, in and around Santa Rosa, Central California, along the coast rather. These grasslands are not particularly natural for the most part. They often are the result of too many fires, overgrazing, a number of things. So the natural condition for much of California that we don't see anymore is chaparral and, and low growing coastal sage scrubs environments that have been eliminated uh, because of our activities over the last 5,000 years or so. So large high intensity wildfires have always been occurring in California. And uh, they always will, but what's the difference? The difference now is people. We've gotten in the way of these things and it's causing a lot of problems. So in an attempt to explain, understand, uh, a lot of people say a lot of things that are not only wrong, but they actually uh, encourage unsafe building plans. Uh, they, they, they cause people not to do things to protect their homes at wood. And so uh, here's a headline in a news article um, after the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa. And it said, shrub choked wildlands played a role in California fires. So I just want you to think about that shrub choked wildlands. I mean, that's just a, a derogatory, horrible phrase. Actually, it's a natural environment out there with a lot of animals and plants that, that, that thrive in this system. It's, it's not a choked anything. It's just a beautiful place. Um, and so a lot of the follow-up of these kinds of things, and this quote was actually in the article, that fuels build up largely the result of firefighters snuffing out almost every wildfire in the area uh, for many years. Well, okay, so just think about this for a minute. The natural fire return interval in Santa Rosa area can be on the order of centuries. Why? Because that area has one of the lowest lightning frequencies in North America. And that's what causes like, uh, fires naturally. So <clears throat> there hasn't been an unnatural fuel buildup because of fire product suppression. What's happened is we've put fuel artificially wise in the form of homes in a much more flammable environment than before. So large fires have always occurred in, in the area up there and throughout California. It's just that our collective memory isn't very long. And so we have a tendency just to think about the current moment. So let's take a look at what happened here. Uh, this is the Santa Rosa area. And I want you to look at it really closely. Coffee Park is uh, on the lower left-hand corner there those, um, by those white structures. So if you look at this area, um, this is not a dense shrubland forest, anything. It, it's, it's a mosaic of vineyards, non-native grasslands. There's some uh, shrub and, and forested areas. 
but it's far from this shrub choked, <laughs> horrible environment that was characterized. Well, here's where the fire came through. And Coffee Park is on the lower left hand corner. If you know about what happened there, it was uh, a devastating event. And it was basically five miles from any contiguous amount of wild land at all in the first place. So what happened? Why did that community just basically get vaporized? So the natural part of, of, of trouble and forested ecosystems in California is this. And you can't have any other kind of fire in these systems other than a complete crown fire, which takes everything out and generates a lot of embers. And that's the, the, the key word here I want you to remember. Um, another point you, you may have heard about is, is, is dead trees. This was in another headline. Sudden oak death likely exacerbated the, the, the deadly Northern California wildfires. Well, let me, let me give you a map of all the dead trees the University of California identified within the Tubbs fire. They're shown in red. Okay, so I want you to just think about this for a minute. How do you think those dead, several dozen, maybe if that, dozen dead oak trees contributed to the Tubbs fire? I mean, they didn't, <laughs> but it's a convenient hook that allows people to, to point in directions other than where they need to, which is really at ourselves in the mirror. Somewhere in the article toward the end, uh, the scientist uh, that was responsible for all these oak tree uh, analysis data sets and, and fire officials, they actually said, we don't know if they had any impact at all, these dead trees. Well, of course they didn't because <laughs> there was no metric to measure that they did, yet the headline made you feel like, oh my gosh, these dead trees, that's what caused the Tubbs fire to become so big. And in fact, they had very little role to play at all. So if we look at the urban environment, this is the, uh, the, the rash of fires that happened around Santa Rosa several years ago. And you probably recognize this. Um, so another headline about these fires that I found particularly disturbing was before the California wine uh, country fires roared through vineyards and neighborhoods, they first blazed through the forest, the shrublands, and the rugged coastal foothills. They started well into the wildland areas and then burned into heavily populated areas, places people would never have expected wildfires to come through. Well, let, let's take a look at where this fire started. It started right up there in the corner. That's the Tubbs fire, all right? And let's check out this incredible wildland far from vineyards and, and, and neighborhoods. Okay, it started in a vineyard. So what you have to be really careful of is when you read things, often people like to catastrophize and make things more uh, horrible, I guess maybe to sell papers or, or just because they like the whole process of being uh, 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 in a sense of panic. But the, the, the story is these fires are starting typically in urban environments or suburban environments. And here's a map that's showing you the fire starts in the Cleveland National Forest in Southern California. And you look at that line there that kind of goes through, that's Interstate 8. That's where most of the fires started in California is along roadsides uh, or where they're uh, doing things like welding or they're you know, it's a spilled over barbecue. So we're causing these fires in our environments and they're spreading into wildlands rather than the other way around. So the moral of the story here is fires are more destructive today because of exponential human population growth and placing homes where they ought not to be. So here's a picture of what happens to a home and we're gonna describe how you can fix it from burning down. So typically a fire front comes through like this and you'll notice uh, there's a wind typically behind it and there's embers. Remember I asked you to remember that word, watch what happens. One gets caught by the tree and where do the other ones go? inside the attic vents and under the eaves, catching the house on fire. So embers are the number one reason homes ignite. They don't ignite by big walls of flame contacting them. Houses don't explode. They actually burn quite slowly. But once one starts, it starts igniting the other homes and then you've got a conflagration like, like you had in a, a coffee park. So what we found in all the research and all the homes that have burned um, and this particular uh, uh, sentence came out of a paper on the Witch Creek Fire from 2007. Virtually no homes 
ignite from a flame front or, or flame contact, they almost all ignite from embers that often travel up to two miles away from the fire front. So often a community is burned down like the town of Paradise uh, before the fire even got there because of the embers. So here's some trees in Santa Barbara. That's not an accent light. That's where an ember landed and the wind caught it and spread these embers everywhere. And you can imagine where they're gonna go. They're gonna land on other things and ignite those. So the number one issue in home ignition is what we call urban fuels. And you gotta think about this. If I wanna save my home from a fire, what do I do? I make my home as safe fire-wise as possible. I wanna start at the house, get that organized and then work outward. The strategy now is to go and clear the native habitat and the landscape and just we'll be fine. Well, I can't tell you how many homes I've seen with up to 300 feet of bare dirt that have burned to the ground. Because actually when you clear a lot of landscape, you're creating environments where embers actually target the home like a bowling alley. Um, and so you don't want to do that. So what do you want to do? Not this. <laughs> um, in fact, when we've examined homes that have burned, uh, any homes that had uh, vegetation management beyond 100 feet, uh, it didn't have any impact at all in terms of the home's survival rate. So here are the factors that you want to look at in terms of protecting your home. And if you look at this one in particular, um, <clears throat> they've done what the fire department asked them to do. They went down and they, they trimmed all the shrubs. They took out a lot of stuff. But what do you see in there? There's a lot of dried grasses. Those grasses are now making that environment more flammable than it was before, even with those shrubs. And what do you see hanging over the canyon? A wood deck. So this house is, is a disaster waiting to happen. And interestingly enough, uh, what we found in research is that homes actually burn more uh, when they're next to grass than they are when they're next to shrubs, which is not what you often hear. And here are the uh, greatest risk factors for homes in terms of uh, uh, burning down. Uh, low to intermediate housing density. So in other words, you have a lot of scattered homes. Uh, that's a pretty high risk factor. Homes older than 30 years, and they have a bunch of features that are not particularly fire safe. Uh, vegetation immediately around the home, um, overhanging or touching. And that means if you have a tree dropping pine needles on the roof, you've, you've got problems. Not the pine needle, not, not the pine tree itself, not the oak tree, but dropping stuff in the gutters around the home. So the answer is not to cut down the trees. The answer is to trim them so they don't overhang the home and keep them there because they will stop embers from landing on the home in areas that you have not been able to maintain properly. So having vegetation around your home properly maintained and, and, and irrigated is one of the key features of keeping homes from burning down. When houses burn and you look at the aftermath, it's often the houses that ignite the trees, not the other way around. And of course, the other thing is, ro is, is road access uh, for firefighters to get in there, but um, that's something most people can't do much about. So here's uh, two homes that burned and set a fire about five or six years ago in San Diego County. If you take a look at the environment, my gosh, they've done everything they, they they've been told to do, they, they put a wall up, they put ice plant, they got these tailored shrubs. What happened? It doesn't matter. The embers hit the houses. Why did they burn down? Because the houses were flammable. So you've got to start from the house out. Emphasis needs to be placed on the built environment, planning, construction, and appropriate defensible space instead of going out and thinking you're going to solve the problem by getting rid of the nature. So I just, we're going to address the, the key features here. This one is kind of out of the homeowner's hands, but I just want to emphasize this to maybe help you select your next home if you're in a dangerous environment. Um, in 1964, there was a fire called the Hanley Fire in Santa Rosa, and it started up there and it burned all the way across the landscape, almost identical to the next fire, uh, which happened several decades later, with Tubbs Fire, which started up there and it came down the same corridor and guess what it hit? Fountain Grove, Coffee Park and everything else. So what's the story here? We allowed homes to be built in dangerous fire area and we're wondering why so many homes were lost. So here's Fountain Grove, 
This is at the tip of the arrow, and this is the aftermath of the Tubbs fire. Every single house gone. So what happened? It got rained on by embers. And if you look around the surrounding homes, a lot of these plants and trees and, and shrubs, they're not even burned. So the houses ignited each other, and the houses were initially ignited by embers. So how do you keep the embers from igniting your home? That's the key feature. That's the primary. You want to start from the house outward. Number one, you want to put embers and vents on your roof. They're very cheap. You can do it for a couple hundred dollars. Um, what they do, they have fine screens, and they, they, they prevent the embers from getting inside of the attic. Sprinklers, which we'll talk about more in a second. Um, yeah, the Australians, the Canadians, they all understand this, that wet homes do not burn. And one of the key features in preventing home loss in those areas is exterior sprinklers. What do we do? We put sprinklers on the inside. Why? Because we've got this paradigm that's been based on the past of urban fires and skyscrapers where you want to save people. Well, OK. The fire coming from in homes anymore, typically, the ones that are causing all the problems, they're coming from the outside. So where should you put the sprinklers? On the outside. <laughs> There's tremendous resistance to this. Everybody's got a thousand different uh, excuses why they won't work. We've got a really interesting handout, which I'll show you on our website in a minute, that'll explain how you get these things, um, how you install them, how do you make them independent if you need to, um, and they'll work in a system where infrastructure goes down, the water pressure is zero, and you got your own system to protect your own home. And it's probably the easiest to do, and it's relatively inexpensive. Um, you can do the simplest version for less than $1,000. If you want your own water tank, you're, you're talking maybe six, $7,000. When you're talking about a million dollar home or a $500,000 home, or maybe for potentially your life, it's not much of an expense. So you want to look outward after you've done your vegetation management, uh, excuse me, or your home retrofitting to, to, to reduce the flammability. And I, I have this picture uh, here just to show you. This tree over on the right, the palm tree, um, that ignited in the fire. And if you'll notice to the left, there's a house there that there's some new construction happening. The palm fronds from that palm tree burned and slammed into that house. And it was about to cause the whole thing to be burned down, but a fire engine showed up. So what did they do? They rebuilt the garage and they trimmed the palm tree getting ready for the next fire. <laughs> the palm tree should be taken out, but we don't think that way. So once you've got your house safe, as far as a non-flammable entity, you want to do proper vegetation management. And that means you don't disturb the soil which would cause weeds to show up, which are more flammable than the surrounding native vegetation. And you thin the vegetation, you don't clear it, and you make it still a sustainable habitat for the animals and the, and the creatures that you love, which is why you probably live in the area you do. Now, granted, if you live in, you don't kind of a thing, but you probably have an area in your neighborhood, same thing. If you don't clear the landscape because then you've guaranteed, uh, you know, yearly expense of clearing the up which are more hazardous than the original shrubs. So let's get back to sprinklers for a minute. Um, here's a system that was put in in Los Angeles. And these are rooftops. And he has under eaves to see those. Um, and I'll again show you my uh, website in a minute here. But just take a look at this. And this, and this is basic. Um, you know, can you? What happens if no notice and the fire is on your back doorstep? Well, that's typically not going to happen. Um, the Woolsey fire in Malibu that happened recently, uh, they had an entire day from where the fire started to when it hit Malibu and burned all those homes. Day. So the homeowners could have hit the button before they evacuated um, and wet down their homes prior to the fire embers showing up, and their homes would have stayed unburned. So this is a very important strategy that I really encourage you to, to consider. So just the main points here really briefly. Um, you've got class A roofing. You got to make sure that uh, the roofing is not flammable. You've got ember resistant vents. You got closed E. You've got rooftop and under sprinklers. 
fire safe landscaping. This house is not gonna burn. In fact, it's about maybe 50 feet from a wildland area that's been properly maintained. And they have a park in the middle of the development, which is where the residents go in the event of a fire. So instead of thinking of fire as a catastrophic, uncontrollable event that's gonna devastate you, your home and your neighborhoods, think of it like the rain, it's gonna happen. What do you do? Well, with the rain, you put gutters up, you make sure your slopes are away from your house so the rain doesn't get into your, under your house or in your basement. Um, same thing with fire. Fire is going to show up. There's nothing we can do. So large, high-intensity wildfires are inevitable. We've got to get that in our mind and stop trying to try to manipulate nature to prevent them. But the catastrophic losses of our communities during such fires is, are not inevitable. So we can do something about this, but we have to focus on our community itself. Second thing is you reduce fire risk from the house out. Focus on the home and figure out how to make that not flammable. And finally, we want to plan for the future, from the future. So a lot of us, at least agency-wise, we're thinking about the last 100 years. Um, with the climate change situation, and I'm going to jump into that really quickly here, it's going to be a whole different environment. And we've got to plan for that. We can't plan for what used to be, because that doesn't count anymore. We've got to be ready for more fires big fires more frequently and prepare our communities accordingly. So to kind of just touch on this and this gets to be a little daunting, but this is the same graph I showed you in the beginning and I wanna just look in the future. Let's magnify that last hundred years. Um, this is a projection now. So, you know, things change, but based on climate change models, um, what we're predicting and remember that dotted line there that's the uh, most extreme level of droughts that we've had in the past thousand years. This is where we're predicted in terms of drought conditions in California and the West over the next hundred years. The average drought condition is gonna be below the most extreme drought condition over the last thousand years. And this little uptick we've been predicting, it's happening now. The next one down, probably in the next few years, it's gonna be worse than the last drought. So how are we going to respond? Uh, by 2050, we've only got you know a couple decades here. We've got to get ready for this. Um, there's nothing we can do at this point. We need to address climate change, but we've got to be prepared if we uh, don't do the right things in that department to make sure our communities are adapted to this new drying environment. I mean, where does this idea of having the house wet from the outside come from? Um, Has it been tried uh, before? Has it been yeah, used they, somewhere? They do it in Canada. They do it in Australia. In fact, up until recently, and there's never been any companies in America that have done these things, but uh, some Australian companies have now shown up here. And there's a company in Canada that you can order this little, set, uh, uh, it's called a uh, wildfire protection kit. It comes in a box like this. It's got two sprinklers. If you have a thousand foot square home, um, they're really easy to install. You put them on the end, on both ends of your house, and they're connected to your water system. And within 30 minutes, your house is, is, is wet. And not just the house, but the surrounding environment. Because when you have a hydrated environment, not only will the house not ignite, but nothing around it will. In fact, the uh, fire agencies in Canada use these in front of the fire fronts to moisten the forest, and the fire stops dead in its tracks. Why we haven't figured this out, I don't know. <laughs> but it well, seems. <laughs> yeah, actually, this is some one of the things that surprised me when I I, I arrived to the U.S. five years ago, and uh -huh. uh, before that, I was living in Russia and also living in uh -huh. the countryside. So we do have outside uh, powder uh, devices for fire suppression, which I could not find here and. Yeah, uh, I guess it all comes with the territory that it's so difficult to legalize any new uh, innovations in a way here that it just takes a long time and things that I've used 20 years ago in Russia that were made 40 years ago in Germany are still not used here widely, which is surprising, but it is what it is. Well, we've got a whole cultural uh framework that prevents these kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, it's getting through to a few people. Um, but uh, yeah, I. It, but but, but I, I, what I see is that like actually takes a lot of people like you to push these solutions forward. I heard the same about uh, the septic system that would actually. Um, use the gray water to um, water the area around the house yeah. that are so difficult to permit because they're not accepted by the town department. And it's kind of part of the same vicious circle that, as you're saying, whatever is wet doesn't burn. And I totally agree that whatever worked in the past is not the prediction that it will work in the future. I am oh, totally that's... with you on that one. Um, there's a question there in the chat about interior sprinklers. So um, yes, it's code now to put interior sprinklers in new homes. Um, frankly, I'd never put them in my home because, you know, <laughs> you want to talk about a disaster, flood your house. Um, and that's what will happen if they come on. And sometimes they come on by themselves, <laughs> you know. So um, however, you know, interior sprinklers, uh, if you're trapped in a home, that's how lives are saved. And that's what they're for. They're not to save the house, they're to save lives. But uh, honestly, um, I, I think it's based on old per perceptions and technology. And the codes are kind of behind what really ought to happen. I'm not going to say that you shouldn't put interior sprinklers inside. But in terms of the fires we face in California, um, in terms of losing your home, they're pretty useless. Uh, I, I think it, it depends, again, if we're talking the fire that is uh, wildfire and then if we're talking the yeah. fire that is... Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you have a stove fire, my gosh, you know, and you have, that's why you have smoke detectors in your house. So all those things are very important. I don't want to minimize those. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, <laughs> there's a bullhorn over here in my right ear talking about clear the habitat, put in interior sprinklers in, uh, fund the fire department. It's so loud. <laughs> I... You know, and I've got this little thing here saying, but the houses keep burning. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I don't want to minimize all those other things, but I, I'd like at least 10% of the attention to be focused on what really matters. And, and that is what's going to keep a home from burning. And, and to be honest, um, I think the losses we've confronted over the last 10 years in terms of communities burning down is completely inexcusable. I mean, there's there's no reason to have had the losses we've had. And frankly, if you were a military commander and you lost an equivalent amount of soldiers in a, you'd lose the war and you'd be canned and they'd replace you. Well, we seem to have this mindset that these fires, they're just gonna take out thousands of homes and there's nothing we can do about it. That's not true. There can be fires in California that are huge, high intensity, ferocious roaring things and not, take out many homes at all if the homes are properly prepared and community members understand the fire environment. And what's happened now is people have been uh, beaten up in a froth of panic over fire to the point where they just throw their hands up and the response now is evacuate, we'll take care of it, that's what the fire service does, and a thousand homes burn. Or people die on the freeway or the highway that is jammed from trying to evacuate. In fact, that's where most people are killed in these California wildfires is trying to evacuate. So that's not properly addressed either. Um, and that's a whole different can of worms. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, I think it's important to distinguish that we are not saying that internal sprinklers are bad. Right. We are not, we are actually, I would actually go one step further and say actually maintain your fire alarms well as well. Don't forget to change the batteries there. Um, because that's also some of the... Uh, Kind of patterns because they're loud and noisy and uh, but we've got to change the patterns there we need them but yeah, this did, is just uh, go ahead yeah. uh, jill had a, has her hand hand up i think she wanted to ask a question that, yeah jill is that true, just jill? To, uh, unmute yourself go for it okay hi thank you for having this i think this is something a lot of people should be thinking about and is not talked about enough and i was actually um, approached by someone up in santa rosa area over a year and a half ago about potentially rebuilding on their property they were on the edge of an open space that completely burned luckily no one was home um, but all the builders up there that they were talking to were just building stick frame homes again and putting no no thought whatsoever 
into what happens next time because the house is just going to burn down again. Um, and so I wanted to bring up a couple of things. Um, there are building technologies out there that are fireproof um, for our plus fire rated wall uh, assemblies. Um, they're not they're not melting, they're not um, combustible, they're not flammable, there's no foam, there's nothing that's going to be like releasing toxic gases when it, if it does burn. Um, it's just not well known and it takes some um, looking to find them. Also in June, I believe this year, uh, Vulcan Vents came out with an event that is uh, wildlife interface certified and it mm -hmm. is fire rated for a regular vented eve. Um, and so that's something that I'm using in some of our projects. Um, and then I think really critical, the information you put forth about the um, landscape. I personally have permitted um, branch drain, uh, gray water systems. I, I am certified in rainwater catchment system designs and stuff. So I'm really familiar with this, but you're, you know, the, the typical suburban landscape is um, not good <laughs> in general um and i think also we we should be very cognizant about um you know trying to solve this problem by putting in a lush landscape that we're watering constantly because that's actually just contributing to the drought problem yeah yeah and, and i think I, i'm totally with you because the whole series is about getting homeowners educated because indeed it's more comfortable for any builder to build the way they used to build. And it's unfortunately up to homeowner to say, wait a minute, this is not what I want. And if you cannot build what I need, I need to go and look for the builder who can. I think that's, that's something that I wanted to bring up and say that yes, it is on a homeowner to say what you need and what you want to be prepared for. Yep. Jill, thank, thank you. you. I'm totally with you on uh, looking into materials that are fire resistant. Um, the same way we're talking about roofs, I think we should be going one step further, actually, Rick, even in, in your materials and say like, by the way, there are systems for walls as well that, that are fireproof these days. So yeah. yep. um, one more question. You said something that the, in the old houses, uh, the windows were also kind of uh, not safe. Can you go into detail what you mean? Yeah, well, when you are in a neighborhood and you've got other homes igniting, um, there's a lot of radiant heat that happens. Um, and that sometimes will uh, cause windows to be displaced or moved. And then that allows embers to get in. So okay. the issue is you got to make sure your house is ember proof, not resistant, but proof. So that means the windows can't be vulnerable to melting like vinyl windows are. Um, they have to be uh, preferably double paned because that'll insulate the heat. There have been situations where curtains on the inside of the house <laughs> ignite because of the radiant heat. Um, but that is not that big of an issue compared to the ember thing. So, you know, if, if you had a cabin out in the middle of a wilderness area or right up against the wildland, um, you know, there's a, there's a series of steps you want to take. Um, and the easiest is the cheapest, right? And that's the ember resistant um, uh, vents, attic vents, the making sure there's no litter and stuff um, from plants on your roof and around. And some little things like a wooden fence. Um, a lot of homes have wooden fences connecting right up to the house. Uh, I can't tell you how many homes I've seen that have ignited that way. I mean, that it's like a fuse. <laughs> The hose ignites from the other house and gets going and gets under the eaves and ignites the next house. Um, and even tile roofing and, and non-flammable roofing, the embers will get up underneath. And that's where the exterior sprinklers will, will help that. And also you wanna make sure you have some vegetation to keep the embers from hitting the house. Um, and then if you have the opportunity to build a new home, my gosh, you can put all sorts of wonderful things like you're saying, the, um, the wall materials and. Yeah. And, and uh, the other thing I didn't mention, which is um, sort of my dream, which is about as far off as I think <laughs> it can get in terms of what's going to happen. We used to take responsibility for our communities uh, and people knew each other. 
there used to be, I, I think it's still out there, this neighborhood watch thing, you know, where people watched out for criminal behavior and they'd call the police. Mm -hmm. And there was a meeting every month, you know, and they'd get together. There ought to be a community fire safety committee um, or group of people. People love to volunteer these for these things with people that actually have gone through uh, safety training, like how to give CPR. They've gone through fire training. There should be a program to help people understand fire and how to respond to it. And there's people in the community, they probably have a CB radio or, or some sort of communication network. And they can be the captains of the neighborhood. And when the call goes to, to evacuate, they don't go. They stay in the community and they're trained to deal with what's going to happen because there will never be enough fire engines. There will never be enough firefighters to take care of what's happening. So if communities start to pick up the slack um, and yeah, there's a risk, of course, you know, but it's not that great compared to what you, you feel from the things you hear nowadays. So I really would promote that notion. Um, and I don't know of any community that's done that yet. I've tried to promote this idea a lot. They have fire safe councils, but they are usually focused on just putting address numbers visible on the house and having chipping days, you know, <laughs> which is pretty minimal in terms of what uh, community safety uh, um, plans can be. So anyway, and also evacuation plans. Uh, most communities, well, I'll say all of them, develop ev evacuation plans for non-disasters. In other words, an event they can plan for. And when the actual disaster happens, <laughs> and disasters sort of uh, defined by not being able to plan for it, people die. And what happened? Well, because they didn't plan for the actual disaster that was gonna happen, they planned for something they could control. And so you have events like you had the Montecito mudslide after the Thomas fire in the, just south of Santa Barbara. It didn't take a rocket scientist to know that was a potential, a big potential. Was there a plan that everybody was on board with? Not a one. And so dozens of homes were destroyed, people were killed huge boulders the size of cars are rolling down. Here's the, here's the irony. The next canyon north of there is Mission Canyon, thereabouts. It's the same kind of a situation. And nobody has decided, you know, gosh, the canyon down south uh, lost so many lives. Maybe we should consider a evacuation plan for here in the event of a fire and a mudslide. Not a word. So it's like, you know, we're in a sense of denial and a lack of planning. And why that is, I don't know, because that's the role of government should inspire that. Um, but I think at this point, it's pretty clear they aren't. So I think communities ought to take the bull by the horns and, and, and develop plans themselves and, and go through the right procedures and get the experts to help them out. But, um, you know, we're going to keep having these disasters until either one, all the homes that are flammable burn, um, or, uh, you know, we change our, our, our perspective on fires and we plan for the future. Okay, there is one question that is kind of a clarification one, and I have one of my own also to clarify, uh, about the crawl space, not the attic space, but the crawl space. Is it the same for the vents? Oh, you mean uh, for under the house, the crawl space? Yeah. Or the... Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, you need, if you have an opening there, and usually it's pretty tight because you don't want rats to get into the house, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, you need to have screens on there too, because um, you know, I don't, I don't have any data on, you know, fires igniting from underneath, but it's it's a real potential. So yeah, I would definitely address that. Mm -hmm. And also for me being a non-English native speaker, uh, is there a difference between a double window and dual pane window? No, it's the same. I think it's the same. The same thing. Yeah. Okay, so it's just that you had both single and dual in your in your slide. So I was like, even dual, even they crack under the. Oh, uh, so are we supposed to do triple now? No, I, um, I think double pane, dual pane, two pane. That's kind of what you want. I, and actually, I think you can't even get single pane windows anymore. <laughs> I think they're all double pane, and which is uh, kind of a bummer because they haven't quite gotten these things nailed down yet in terms of design. And sometimes within ten years, they start leaking and then the fog gets in and the inside of your window gets moldy. It's happened in my house twice. <laughs> Number of, so I, that's an issue, but I don't even think you can get single painted windows anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to be sure that I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm getting correctly about the dual paint because to me it's like 
definitely better than one pain. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't want to jump the gun and go for triple pain with Hukum. Because oh, they're kind a... of expensive. What's that? Expensive triple pain. Double pain or well, triple pain? Uh, that's a little overkill, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. Like, yeah, yeah. What's the recommendation? Uh, there's one more question here about eliminating natural gas. Uh, would electricity only help reduce fires? You know, um, uh, I I don't. Based on the information I know, I don't think. I mean, you know, we used to have open flames in homes all the time and the gas lanterns right i mean and that's why a lot of homes burn which is one of the reasons why they actually develop fire departments because of those internal flames but i think natural gas now is pretty safe it's one of the safest mechanisms by which you can heat your home and and do the things you need to do like cook um and it's it's not really the source of much ignition in terms of homes i mean you get those freak episodes like that gas line that exploded up in the Bay Area there. PG&E had a problem with their maintenance. Um, but um, I really don't think uh, natural gas is, is the issue because when you have embers coming in, they're igniting the the eaves, the wood, the trash cans. That, and yeah, eventually the gas will uh, take off, but that's after the house is pretty much burned down. You know, And even propane tanks, I mean, they'll explode. Uh, when they're heated up and that happens, but typically they don't really contribute too much to the fire spread. I mean, that's that's kind of a, that event sort of happens after most of the disaster occurs. But unfortunately they didn't give us any, any choice. They just banned gas in uh, new construction. Oh, really? It's part, it's part of the oh, new, interesting. new so building, they're... new building code uh, that everything in uh, new construction has to be electric. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. That's part of the climate. Uh, oh, yeah. OK. Addressing right. the climate change, I guess. Well, I guess that's a mute, moot discussion then. It's going to happen anyway. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, there you go. Oh, that's interesting. I'm glad. Uh, yeah, there's a question about who, who, who to install exterior sprinklers. Um, let me uh, tell you that, okay, there's a guy, um, let me find my website here. Can I share my screen again? Yep, of course. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's go. Uh, there's a video here on my website and it's, um, it's up at the fire tab and, and you go down protecting your home. There's an outstanding video. It's about a 13 minute video at Colin. Everything you wanna know. <laughs> is in that video, except for the exterior sprinkler issue because it was done um, with some old thoughts, even though Jack has said exterior sprinklers will, will help. There's some pictures here of embers and you, you, you get the idea, right? <laughs> These things are flying everywhere. Um, right here, you, you click this um, and it gives you about a 10 page booklet that gives you references and everything else. I don't have anybody in the Bay Area um, but this guy here, uh, Tom Schiller, he's got a company in Murphy's, California. It's in the Sierra Nevada. And he sells these little sprinklers here. This is the one I was mentioning. For 200 bucks, you can get um, a system. And they sit there. Let me see if I can play this thing. There you go. Can you see the sprinklers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I think to, to answer Jill's question, I think any contractor can do it if he understands what he needs to do. Well, and, and here's the problem. Um, most of them, this is new and they don't know what the, this kind of system you can do yourself as a homeowner. Um, but, uh, um, you know, the, unfortunately, we're not there yet, you know. So there are some contractors I have them listed in the document that's on my website. Um, and you can go from a basic system about $12,000 all the way to $100,000. It's an automatic thing. It turns on, you know, with, with heat and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, anytime you have somebody install something, it's going to cost more. So if you're handy, it's a pretty simple thing to do, um, under even misters and sprinklers on the roof. And, and the, the trick is once you get the pipe down below, you, if you really want to be secure, you need an independent system. 
If you have a pool in your yard, that's perfect. But you do need to get a, a, a diesel or, or some kind of pump that's independent that you can throw a hose in the pool and hook up to your sprinkler line. And if you don't have a pool, then that means you got to get a water tank. And those are six, seven thousand um, dollars. But uh, you know, if you're if you hire a contractor that's handy that knows how to work with things, that's really what you need. And um, you can contact. There's three or four companies that actually do it um, that are listed in my booklet. Um, you can contact them, get some ideas. But we're kind of on our own here, unfortunately. Well, at least we are getting the information at the right time. Yeah, well, that's that's the main uh, thing. That's yeah, start. that's a big step forward. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I think we are at the end of our hour. Thank you very much for your time today. And sure. uh, I make sure that we share this video with as many people as we could. Oh, well, that'd be great. Uh, and, uh, yeah. you know, um, I'll put my uh, email here. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, I'll be more than happy to um, answer any yeah. question. California, California, California. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, there are now yeah. rainwater tanks that are less expensive than what you are saying. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you can use the rainwater tank the yes. same way for. Well, what a, for and that's a great system. source of water too, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure to be here today. Um, and let's uh, see where the world takes us next year. Yeah, thank you. Right, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rick. Bye.